Hi, and welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg, and uh, we're in our Walking in the Word series, and we've entered the New Testament. Last week we introduced the New Testament, what it's all about, and today we're going to start with the Gospels. And uh, we're going to actually not, and the Gospels are arranged Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we're going to start with Mark. The Gospel of Mark, and uh, there's a reason for that. I'm going to get to that in a second. The Gospel of Mark is it traditionally attributed to the character of John Mark in, in the Bible. So tradition is that Mark's parents rented the upper room for Jesus and his disciples for the Passover Seder um, the night before Jesus was crucified. Uh his mother name his mother's name was Mary and we know that from Acts 12:12 12, 12. and he was a cousin to Barnabas and we'll meet we'll meet Barnabas when we get to the book of Acts but Barnabas is mentioned as his uncle in Colossians 4:10 uh he was a missionary companion to Paul and Barnabas and uh, we find that out in Acts 13 verse 5 and uh John Mark turned back in the middle of their trip, and uh, this caused a uh, rupture in uh, Paul's confidence in in Mark, and uh, eventually caused a, a division between Barnabas and Paul. Um, and Paul then went on and did his second and third missionary journey with uh, Silas, and Barnabas and Mark went off to Cyprus. However, by the time the book of Colossians is written, it seems that that division has been healed. So if you read Colossians chapter 4, uh, verses 10 and 11, Ara, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, as does Mark, Barnabas' cousin. Uh, so he's, he's his cousin, not his, uh, not his nephew. So uh, Mark, Barnabas' cousin, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And so does Jesus, who is called Justice. These alone are the circumcised, are my co-workers in the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. So Mark is among those who are aiding, uh, who are aiding uh, Paul as he is imprisoned when he's writing this letter. And uh, so this rift between Mark and, uh, and Paul has, has been healed. Um, he Mark is also mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.11, Philemon 24. Um, he's mentioned in 1 Peter 5.13, where Peter refers to him as a son. So it seems that not only is, is Mark very close with Paul, he's also very close with Peter as well. So the Gospel of Mark, it's, it's a compact gospel. So you don't have long, drawn-out sermons like you do in Matthew, um, or you know, long sections of parables like you will have in Mark. It's compact. It's action-packed. Um, you hear the, you read the words quickly and uh, immediately. Those are some of Mark's favorite words that he uses. Um, this gospel is probably dictated to Mark from Peter. This is probably Peter's stories of his time with Jesus. And um, it's probably all of these little snippets that Peter remembers uh, and he's giving them to Mark and Mark's writing them down. Um, it could have been written as early as 35 AD, but probably around 50 or 64, between 50 and 64 AD in that time period. The writing reflects direct observation, and it's not a translation from oral traditions. So it seems like that there was something that Mark was writing down. He's the original writer to this. It has an abrupt ending, and even though the edges is though somebody cut the scroll off early on. Now the ending of Mark is kind of controversial, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, but the actual traditional ending of Mark is very, very abrupt. Um, 
Mark's ending is is a sort of controversy, and uh, today there are two accepted endings. Uh, verse sixteen, uh, chapter sixteen, verse eight. This is the earliest manuscripts we have end here. Um, some later manuscripts um, end at chapter sixteen, verses nine through twenty, and these are probably written, not written by Mark more than likely not written by Mark, but were added around the end of the first century, maybe the early second century. And second century theologians know about these endings and were okay with it. They counted it as scripture. So just because it wasn't written in Mark and wasn't in the original doesn't mean that we throw it away and say, oh, that's not scripture. The early church fathers believed it was scripture, so if it was good enough for that, it was good enough for me. Um, something that's interesting about Mark, Mark is a source document for Matthew and Luke. So 97% of Mark is in Matthew and 88% of Mark is in Luke. Um, if you want to read the Gospel of Mark, read Matthew or Luke because the whole Gospel's in there. Uh, most probably, he's a source for those two Gospels. Mark is also a name dropper. Um, so you look in this gospel when he's talking about specific individuals and he's dropping names. And the reason for this is that they were people that were probably known in the early church who could verify what Mark was saying is, is being true. They probably could testify to the accuracy. So, for example... Uh, chapter 15, verse 21, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way in, from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. So this is the famous scene of Jesus carrying the cross and the Romans enlist uh, this fellow named Simon to carry it. Well, not only does, does Mark drop his name Simon, but he also drops his boy's names, Alexander and Rufus. Which means he's saying, if you don't believe me, ask Alexander and Rufus. They'll tell you they're, it, what, what's the truth. So look for that. It's, it's interesting when you find those names. Um, so what are the reasons that Mark wrote this gospel? Well, first of all, it's catechal. So there's a need for to preserve apostolic tradition, meaning that we needed to get what Peter's experience was down on paper. There was a there was a, a a drive within the early church for writing down what the disciples experienced, and Peter was a large part of that. Uh, there's a pastoral reason for this gospel. It's a call to the church uh, to persevere through persecution, um, to get through what's happening to them. Um, and then there's theological. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is it, it attacks a bunch of false teachings. When you read First and Second Peter, that's something that Peter's very, very concerned with, is that there are a number of false teachers and false teachings going around. And the Gospel of Mark does a very good job at preserving Peter's recollections of Jesus and what Jesus said, so that we can have an account of what is true theology and what is false theology. Now, there's no nativity scene in Mark. It picks up right with his ministry in Galilee. And in fact, all of Jesus's ministry in the Gospel of Mark is in Galilee. Jesus does not travel to Jerusalem until the end in chapter 11. And at that point, the text slows. It just really slows down. It goes from one instance to the other instance to the other instance. You have three years of ministry packed into 10 chapters. That's that's a lot. And these chapters aren't very long either. So he's packing a lot in there. And then all of a sudden, chapter 11, chapter 11 is one week's worth of events. Chapter 11 to, the, to 16, it's just one week's worth of events. So it slows down. And there's a tradition that this was actually written before Mark started writing the gospel, that this was written by the the disciples and the followers of Jesus pretty close after Pentecost to get down what had actually happened during that Passion Week. And then Mark picked that up and put it into his gospel. 
So um, the text slows down and it has this um, sense of an, an event that has to be remembered. So that is, that is the Gospel of Mark. Um, you can read it in a couple of hours. And it's, it's, to me, it's one of my favorite Gospels to teach from because it sets up your understanding for both Matthew and Luke. And then when we get to John, we'll see how John sort of looks at Matthew, Mark, and Luke and says, well, these guys told the best of that. I'm going to tell some other things. So John is very, very different from the other three. John is very theological. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew and Luke depend upon Mark an awful lot for, as a source document. So let's then go to Matthew. So Matthew is a gospel that is traditionally attributed to Matthew the, the tax collector. Um, Matthew is not mentioned outside of the gospels. Interesting, huh? He's only mentioned within the gospels. Matthew is a very Jewish gospel. Now, what do I mean by that? Matthew focuses on those things in the wording and the uh, stories that would be very important to Jewish people. So let's let's take for example the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew five through seven. Um, this is essentially a retelling of Torah. It's a reworking of Torah, the new law. It it reaches back into much of the Old Testament and brings Old Testament ethics and morality and concepts and brings it forth into the Jewish, into the Jesus light, where the, the law was focused on what you did. Jesus is more concerned with what you think and what you believe. Because what you think and what you believe, according to Jesus, is going to dictate how you act. And if you don't believe in the acts that you're doing, if you're doing them just for the sake of doing acts, then you're not doing it because you love God. You're doing it because you love yourself and you want to get benefits for yourself. So all that to say that Matthew is very Jewish in his way of approaching the gospel story. There's a tradition that Matthew may have been written in Hebrew first. There's no evidence at all for this, but this is so cool I want it to be true. You know, it's one of those things that is so cool that, you know, to think that Matthew might have been written in Hebrew first. Um, he wants to show us that Jesus, first and foremost, is from the line of David. He is a new type of Moses and that the kingdom of heaven has arrived. This is a theme that you will see throughout the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven, and this is what Luke and Mark call the kingdom of God, they're the same things, that has arrived. The most prominent theme throughout Matthew is this theme of kingdom of heaven. And the teachings and the parables talk about what this kingdom looks like. Chapters 5 through 7, like we mentioned, the Sermon on the Mount tells us what God's kingdom is really all about. Um, the Chosen, which is a fantastic uh, mini series on the life of Jesus. It's not scripture, but they draw from scripture depicting the life of Jesus. Um, they, Jesus talks about the Sermon on the Mount uh, as being a kind of map to how people can find him. If you read and live the Sermon of the Mount, uh, Sermon on the Mount, then you're going to find Jesus. Um, after teaching, Jesus would then demonstrate what his kingdom looks like. So chapters 8 through 10 are nine stories on how the kingdom of heaven, heaven is demonstrated. Jesus calls people to follow him. And this is really part of that demonstration of the kingdom of God. So who is it that follows Jesus? Uh, the irreligious, the unimportant people, the unclean people, the outside outsiders. These are the people that are following Jesus. 
Jesus calls people to go out and talk about the kingdom. And so this is, this is all part of this Matthew narrative of the kingdom of God arriving, calling the people, the others, the, the, the people in society that aren't in the upper echelons, you know, the whole idea of the first will be last and the last will be first is demonstrated in how Jesus works his ministry throughout the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is the rescue plan that God has put in place to save the human race from their condition of sin, which is what separates them, us, from God. The kingdom of heaven is Jesus. Okay, let me say that again. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is Jesus. It is the presence of Jesus in humanity. And that's why the king, those that think that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is heaven, the afterlife, are, are really mistaken. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is here and it's now. So when we become followers of Jesus, and we put our faith, hope, and trust into him, we receive the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus. It is the kingdom. We become citizens of that kingdom. And when we get together with others who are followers of Jesus, that's the kingdom. The kingdom expanded. And when we meet people who are not followers of Jesus, we are giving them a taste of what the kingdom is truly like. And everything that Jesus did, all of that ministry and demonstration of the kingdom is what we're to be doing today. Jesus brought his ministry to the Jews and the Gentiles. So the healing of the demoniac in chapter 8, verses 28 through 34, he was a Gentile. The feeding of the huge crowds, the 5,000 in chapter 14, 13 through 21, they were Jewish. The 4,000 in chapter 15, just a chapter later, verses 32 through 39, they were Gentile. So, this is a theme that we're going to see throughout the New Testament, and it's a tension. The gospel is for the whole world. It's for the whole world. It's not just for the Jews. It's first to the Jews, but then to the Gentiles. The gospel is for everyone. The gospel unites. The gospel is to unite these two ethnicities. And when we talk about Paul's letter to the Romans, that's a big part of what Romans is all about, is bringing two parts of the church, the Jewish church and the Gentile church, back together again. And here is the thing that is seriously pointed out throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Fundamentalist legalism divides people. When you are looking only to the strict letter of the law and not looking at to the heart of individuals, you are necessarily dividing. You are necessarily dividing. You are making yourself higher and the other person, the other, the outcast. And who did Jesus go to? You see this over and over through Matthew. He went to the outsider. He went to the other. Jesus was to be a different kind of king in a different kind of kingdom. So instead of being a conquering king, and this is kind of what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were looking for, even the Essenes and uh, the Zealots. That was another group within Israel, the Zealots. Uh, they, were, they were more of a... Uh, terrorist group, to put it bluntly, um, they were looking for the Messiah to be a conquering king, to overthrow Rome and establish, you know, the throne of David again. Um, 
instead of a conquering king with military power, Jesus would be the king of Isaiah 53. You remember when we talked about Isaiah and chapter 53, go back and read it. This is the suffering king. This is the suffering Messiah, the suffering servant. Jesus made an assertion of this kind of kingdom and it disrupts the religious leaders so much that they have him killed by the Romans. The killing of the king is the ultimate act of servanthood. However, and we see this in the end of Matthew, the resurrection is the king's victory over humanity's sin and death is destroyed. And what does Matthew leave us with at the end? Well, here are Jesus' words. And what do we do with this kingdom? Matthew 28, verse 18, All authority has been given to me and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. What did he give the disciples? What does he give to us? All authority. All authority has been given to him. And he is passing that to us, and we are to go, not stay, but go and make converts? No, disciples, followers of Jesus. It's not enough that you just say a prayer and be on your way. Um, it's to follow Jesus, make him Lord of your life. Of who? All nations, everybody, everybody. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, teaching them who Jesus was, what he did, and how he said we should live. Jesus would always be with us to the end of the age. So that's the beginning of the Gospels, Mark and Matthew. And next week we're going to be looking at Dr. Luke and his two works. He has the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. But until then, this is Chaplain Greg. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe this video on YouTube. Share it with other people. Comment and uh, send me an email if you would like, wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. And I'm happy to return your email. So until next week, God bless.